Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of our In Conversation series about material methods. For anyone not yet familiar with this series, um, Sophie Woodward and me are co-leading the series for the National Center for Research Methods. And we are inviting uh, different colleagues uh, in different, very diverse disciplines to talk about their ways how they um, develop and apply material methods in uh, their work. So today I am delighted to be hosting Leonie Hannan who is the senior lecturer in 18th century history at Queen's University Belfast with a background working in museums and heritage. You're mainly, um, your research mainly, uh, Leonie, is um, about the practices of atypical intellectuals in the 18th century. And, and you make a case for the home as an important material site of inquiry. So that's very interesting. I understand this is your latest book project. So could you just say a few words about you know, the house as, as this kind of site for, for um, material inquiry? Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much for having me, Natasha. This is um, a really fascinating area, um, material methods. And I think we'll get to a few different threads of that as we go through. But yeah, the thing I'm really working on most at the moment, amongst other um, diverse projects, is this idea of the home, the early modern home, as a site of inquiry. Um, I started off very much looking at women and women's intellectual lives. And that's what led me to the home, because, of course, they had all of their kind of you know, learning and exploration, or very a lot of it would happen at home. And so I started to see this space as, and not one in exactly of a kind of closed space of kind of work and drudgery and childcare and nothing else, um, but to start to think of it as a, a space which could allow for more interesting things. So um, one of the things I was really interested in thinking about is the material dimensions of the home. Now, we live in an age of hoovers and uh, electric ovens and all sorts of technology, right? Um, but in the early modern home, um, lots and lots of things were produced from scratch. And so um, and the, there were a series of complex material processes to produce just the basic things that the household needed to survive on, whether that was bread or whether that was cheese or whether that was beer, right? Um, and you start to get a glimpse from account books and recipe books from this period of just the huge amount of material knowledge these people had. And um, whether that was servants or people who um, owned homes and um, organised servants work, um, they had, you know, quite a, a decent material literacy and one that, um, and then a lot of these processes were ones that allowed for a form of experimentation. You know, how exactly do you get the best ale well you might adjust some parts of that long process that long material process to get there so I suppose what I wanted to do is look at how um, the specific material dimensions and affordances of home actually actively encouraged intellectual inquiry in this period um, for people who we may not have heard of you know people who are not fellows of the Royal Society at this time yes that is fascinating so um, thinking about uh, the material culture in general and, and the material culture in a particular period. So um, how uh, would you define um, material culture methods that you do perhaps you know, in your discipline? Uh, but also uh, I, am, I, I do know that uh, you um, see yourself as an interdisciplinary uh, researcher and academic. So, um, uh, would you would you tell us how we uh, you know how we go understand uh, you know material culture methods in 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 your um, view? Yes. Yeah, you're right. It's just totally interdisciplinary. So, um, from a historian's point of view, the way that we have um, learned to do material culture history, we sometimes sometimes call that. Um, it's really by pulling things in from outside, right? Our discipline 
incredibly, um, in its traditional sense, our discipline is incredibly textual. Now, this isn't quite true of people who do ancient history and some medievalists, because where the textual record gets uh, thinner, people, historians have reached for objects and artifacts to try and explain the past. But for people working on the kind of period I'm in, so from the early modern period on through to the modern period, it's, it's been text, 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 and our training is incredibly textual. So we've had to look to anthropologists, archaeologists, art historians, curators, um, museum professionals, we've had to look to all of these people to pull in ideas about how you actually work with material culture. Within history, I would say, largely speaking, material culture history is still often very textual. So questions may be driven to some extent by interest in mater the material world of the past. Um, they may use material culture as one part of many different kinds of, sort of material. But we're still often looking at the subject of materiality and material worlds through paper, through textual sources. And a lot of my work is like that. Having said that, I have um, worked much more with kind of object analysis in various parts of my career. And myself and Sarah Longer wrote a book aimed at historians and students of history, trying to talk about history through material culture, acknowledging that you can do a lot of material culture history by by engaging with um, books and recipe books and all sorts of kind of textual sources. Um, but, you, but, but trying to push people to think about the intellectual benefits of direct object analysis um, and what that can bring to your thinking that is different um, from perhaps methods that we're more familiar with, we're more comfortable with. Um, so material methods for historians um, don't necessarily mean object analysis, but it certainly can do. And I think increasingly that is the case or part of the picture anyway. Yes, and, and that is exactly what you have done. So would you say that um, you work with so different texts and archives, but also you combine that with um, uh, object-based observation or, you know, object-based object methods? So what is um, object-based? methodology and and also object-based learning because I know uh, you know in your extensive work in in museums and and, and um, their collections um, mm. you have uh, explored objects uh, with um, interdisciplinary with an interdisciplinary team and you also um, have engaged in, in object-based learning so that's very interesting can you say a little bit about that yeah so there's two sort of wings that I would say to my interest in this kind of um, direct object handling. One of them is object based learning, um, which I can explain and talk a little bit about. Um, and the other side of it is, um, is an approach myself and Kate Smith at the University of Birmingham took when we were both working at UCL where we took a bunch of researchers um, from a real wide range of disciplines and put them in front of objects and um, prioritized and emphasized that um that relationship with that object and then we work collaboratively you know we each had an object and we work collaboratively collaboratively together to think through material methods really and experiments and um provocations around, around how we how we look at objects how we can look at objects how we can learn from objects so there are these two slightly different things but they're actually very roughly the same thing so I can give you a bit more of a, an idea about the object-based learning if you like to start with in some sense the basis you know all researchers are you know we often artificially separate the idea of research and then teaching and learning but actually of course we're all learning aren't we like researchers are just trying to learn stuff so so I think um, this is why object-based learning is really at the heart of a lot of this. Now, I um, can no longer claim to work directly on object-based learning, but I spent a good number of years working with brilliant colleagues at UCL who are still very much at the forefront of this um, field. So Professor Helen Chatterjee um, and also Linda Thompson, who's a psychologist. Helen Chatterjee is a, actually a biologist and a zoologist. So she came at objects from a completely different kind of disciplinary um, perspective to myself. Um, and also now Thomas Cador, who's an archeologist, which again, um, gives a, a different perspective on artifacts. So these um, guys have really pioneered um, 
the evidence base for object handling as a route to better understanding within adult learners and specifically in a higher education context. So the backdrop to this, of course, for anyone who knows about education studies, mm -hmm. But there have been actually loads of work done on active and experiential learning for um, school aged children, right, and young, young people. And there was a real sense that these people needed it. This was very much based and linked to ideas about learning styles, which have gone slightly in and out of fashion and been kind of changed over time, how people um, think about and understand learning styles. But, you know, this notion that not everyone learns brilliantly and it's not always a brilliant learning experience to just be told things, right, and then to try and absorb them. And that actually engaging your senses, engaging your own meaning making, making those connections by doing things um, and talking about those processes with your peers can be a much better form of learning. So ditch the lecture into the kind of workshop scenario. And, and you know, we were making the case that this is very much true for adults as well as, as kids. Like, and, um, and I think it's very much true of researchers as well. So... Um, with object-based learning, we would often put, um, you know, students in front of objects. Now, sometimes that would have a subject link. So, there were, you know, Helen had come through her training and her engagement with object-based learning came from putting her students in front of skeletons so they could understand, uh, you know, morphology and evolution and all sorts of, of, of those concepts. And I come much more from a kind of trying to learn history through looking at heritage or historical artifacts so um but we would also try and use or when I was working around this I would try and use unusual combinations so putting humanities students in front of very science type objects you know mixing things around because I also felt and this is where there's the link to the research project that Kate and I Kate Smith and I um, ran called the 100 hours project mm -hmm. that I felt that objects can be provocative they can Eight unusual disjunctures in your thinking. They can create a kind of barrier sometimes, and that needs that if you bother, if you take the time to work through, you can get somewhere quite different. So my sense was that um, text is often linear, not linear, but very narrative oriented. And then, of course, our whole process as academics and researchers is to write things up into a narrative. Okay, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And, you know, Sarah Longer, who I wrote um, the research guide with, was very firmly, she's someone who spent a long time working in education at the British Museum. Um, she's an academic now at Lincoln. And she firmly believed, and I agree, that objects send you out in all these different directions. So they sort of um, subvert that process of turning our research into this nice narrative. They don't send you off in one direction, they send you off in 10. And those 10 directions are com maybe complete, feel very unrelated. But I think in terms of challenging yourself to think differently about a subject, they can be so powerful. And so there is this process of just meaning making for yourself through tactile and multi-sensory engagement. But mm -hmm. so this element of um, provocation, I think that you get with objects that is, that is something special and can really help um, people really of all ages engaging with a given subject. Absolutely, and, and I can uh, relate to that, you know, through my research because um, what um, I have done um, is the research looking at, you know, graphic methods that link to material uh, methods um, because, uh, you know, images and graphic representations, they can uh, capture and show different elements, you know, of the material environment. And then we can use them to um, inquire uh, concepts, different concepts in different disciplines, or create uh, and create new knowledge, develop knowledge on a topic or around a particular um, challenge or, or problem uh, when, when you combine, uh, you know, uh, methods or, or a methodological, methodological approach that is more textual or, or language based and more kind of material or, or visual. So um, from, from, from that experience, I do understand that, um, you know, learners knowledge and, and, and I also think researchers knowledge and understanding can be really enriched 
when we work in, in, in um, interdisciplinary groups, but also um, introduce, when we introduce new um, ways of thinking, you know, of, of, about different, different areas, different topics. So um, that, that, is, that is something that uh, definitely uh, link, uh, you know, the materiality of the yeah. world and, and uh, our everyday materiality, because, you know, you started, you said that at the beginning of, of the video um, of, of our conversation, that, uh, you know, we are uh, now in our homes, especially you know, in, the, in the present situation, spend so much time uh, surrounded by, um, you know, material, ma ma material objects, different, uh, we use different things and, and they mediate our uh, everyday reality. And, and I think that's, that's very interesting, you know, how we relate to both built and natural environment, kind of interior design, uh, you know, different, um, you know, small and big objects. So, can I can I just ask before we uh, wrap up um, if you could um, give a very uh, specific example? Maybe you know, just uh, provide um, an example where you um, talk about a particular object and and how you um, you know how you went about. Uh, you know, exploring that object, uh, both, you know, with your team and, and, and with, um, you know, learners and, and, you know, which disciplines, uh, you know, the learners um, came from when you went, when you did that work. So the most intensive um, bit of object analysis in a way um, was through the 100 hours project because the process that we put people through there, there were 12 of us in total. So Kate and I led the project and we drew in 10 other researchers. Um, there were curators, art historians, historians of science, anthropologists, um, artists. Um, so we had a real range of people, right? Um, and we, everyone chose an object from um, the UCL collections. And I chose a plaster cast of um, a child's foot from the pathology collections. And it showed um, talipers, which is, I mean, sometimes known as club foot. So it's a, it's a foot that, um, that now there would be various operations that you could do to, um, to correct that. But anyway, it's, so it's this little cast. And it was a number, it was one of a number of casts in the collection of childhood pathologies. Um, now, I the process we put people through and I went through was that we would return again and again to the object. And the idea was that we would, that as we went on, we would gain a familiarity with that object and we would, and through that insight may come. Now this prompted a number of sorts of reflections within the group. So I would say for, for many of us, not all of us, um, for many of us, research really means extensive source-based research. So we go to lots and lots of different places to try and gather bits and we try and put it together to create a larger um, whole. Now, some, some disciplines don't work exactly like that. Um, literary scholarship would be a good example of a discipline where returning to a text time and again is something that is considered to be fruitful to your analysis of it, that you've come... Yeah fresh, you come with a new perspective, you may see something different. Um, so there was, so we were trying to apply some of those, those techniques, but what was interesting was because people felt strongly that they wanted to push their, um, their engagement with the material and slightly eschew their perhaps usual urge to run to the archive to try and contextualize this object. Mm -hmm. Many sat again and again with this object um, trying to just pull meaning from it, from its material presence um, with little recourse to those kind of contextual angles. And so that was really, really in interesting because um, at times people talked about a familiarity, you know, a really deep familiarity. There was very, very strong feelings in the end about some of these objects. And um, uh, um, I felt the same about, about my one. Um, and to experiment with um, refusing some of our normal kinds of um, approaches, I guess. Um, but in the end, these, these studies, these um, 
became really they became a a, a reflection on methodology and method now we wouldn't suggest that just returning to an object and and um over and over again is necessarily the best route to answering any given research question but what it did do is it pushed us into directions we wouldn't normally go to so we had um a scholar and historian of um colonialism and colonial collecting of objects from around the world with um, a dodo skeleton holding the weight of the bones in her hands and trying to infer things about her interests from that. And, you know, these were deeply, um, deeply challenging kind of engagements. But yeah, in the end, the group, um, we certainly found things out about our objects. Many of us did in the end return to the archive to try and find out more. Um, we fleshed them out, we made them into a source of collection of their own. There was 12 objects that became associated with each other in a new way, in a way they hadn't been before. In general, the conclusions and the thought processes that um, came out of that were about, um, about approaches, about material methods, about the importance of engagement with the material, I think, as well as, as, well as the textual, not to, not, to, uh, not to say otherwise, but yeah. Brilliant. So, so basically, it sounds that um, the methods, uh, you know, the, the, the kinds of methods like object based inquiry or, or object based learning is all about um, a different way of thinking about the you know, lateral thinking, thinking outside the box that actually can bring really um, something new to your knowledge ab about um, an area or your own discipline uh, or, or a concept. So that, that's really fascinating because um, it, it can be transformative, you know, for uh, the person doing the inquiry, but also for the entire group, you know, when, when you do it yeah. together. Yeah, yeah so uh, that, is, that is fantastic. Really, really fascinating. And, and thank you so much for your time, Leon. I do, do just want to uh, finish this recording, this conversation uh, with the, a uh, little re reflection, short re reflection about um, what, you know, the future holds for, for uh, material culture methods in your opinion. Yeah, it's a really interesting moment to ask that question, isn't it? Um, I mean, I'm obviously very invested in this as, as, um, as something that I hope will, will have a long term effect on the sort of discipline I work in and the disciplines I work um, with. Um, and I think it is a really interesting moment because, of course, the museum sector right now is completely absorbed with digital manifestations of objects. So it's always been a great defence and, and a correct defence of the need for in-person and um, often tactile um, engagement with objects. Museums are, are brilliant at facilitating and allowing that, right? Um, so that and look that 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 looking directly at something that in front of you, right? It's, even if it's behind glass. But right now, of course, because museums have been shut for various periods of time because suddenly uh, touch is like the taboo. We can't touch um, other things without sanitizing. We can't um, even be close to other people. So in this moment of pandemic. Um, it throws in the air some of the things, exactly, some of the things that we would have um, absolutely championed. So I think it's a really interesting juncture, but for me, where the digital comes in, and you may find this yourself with in terms of interest in, in, in graphics and um, visual culture, is where digital comes in, I think um, it isn't too, I, I feel that the two were much more together than, than we might think. So often people, who have um, who have been the people who've driven forward like digital methods of engagement with um, artifacts, for example, are not the same people who are running object handling classes. But I think increasingly that we have to see the synergy between these two halves, and that in a world where we're increasingly living our worlds, living our lives through screens and through um, through computers, effectively, um, there will be that 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 obvious urge to make, to do, to touch, to engage with the mechanics and the materiality of things will, will only grow. And I think we can see that in popular culture yes. spaces, you know, <laughs> endless sourdough bacon, you know, we can see it coming through in our culture. And so 
for me and for me people concerned with collections I think um I think these two we have to think thinking about material methods and digital methods as two halves of the same process um um and yeah yes yes I think I think uh that is definitely the way forward and, and how we connect our lab uh, very much uh, you know digitalized interactions and the digital world that it, it, you know we are inhabiting right now um, and and you know the, the tactile um, nature of our lives and and uh, and that is definitely something to be impacted in the future so thank you very much I'm sure that uh, we have uh, sparked uh, an interest in uh, material culture methods, uh, you know, among our viewers, and also that they will uh, check your work. Uh, thank you very much for your time for and me. for sharing your insights. And I'm just saying bye to everyone uh, watching the video and uh, enjoy.